Okay, good afternoon, guys. Let's do uh, another live North Farm Peril. Um, come around quick yet again. Do an instant poll. Check if I can hear the volume correctly. Grip up that new screens now. Let me know the sound's perfect, too loud or too low. Standard settings to me, so it should be fine for you guys. Okay, that's great. Thank you, guys. So, uh, I, I guess, yeah, I mean, here we are again. Non Farm Peril last time around was, uh, again, another, another shock and another, you know, good piece of uh, US data. Really all now pushing Janet Yellen into a corner, uh, which I've said for so long now, I'm getting tired of saying it. You know, it, it seems that I say these things and the world just seems to snap in and think, oh, yes, that's, that's quite a good idea, Steve, isn't it? Yeah, we should start normalizing rates. And yes, all this good US data means that, you know, we should take the lead and, uh, you know, try and sort out the economy because otherwise we're just going to create another massive bubble and everything's going to fall apart again. But here we are. I guess the main thing to take away as always in non-farm payrolls, is not just about the headline figure. Uh, good or bad today um, it, it will certainly have an impact on the markets. I think good figures really are leading me to the question, are we going to hike in September? Um, mixed messages from the different voting members of the Fed, but essentially everybody's saying that there will be a rate hike this year. Um, and, you know, again, it might be, as we saw last year, it might be one late rate hike you know and maybe one squeezed in before the end of uh, end of the year and then nothing really much next year uh, again a more wait and see type attitude after we put uh, you know the, the, this you know the, this new condition into rates but really you know it's, it's the, the problem is you know even that you know i keep saying these things i understand economics but i don't really understand people anymore and i certainly don't understand politics especially american politics so it's very hard to make rational arguments and long-term views when the people that are making these decisions probably don't know themselves so no matter what's going to happen today we're going to see some movement some volatility and i guess as always it's understanding what the figure means in the short term i mean when the instant that it comes out but then also in the kind of like short and medium term what investors what traders will be positioning themselves for so we're definitely going to see some movement in that dollar yen it's been very volatile over the last um you know, a few sessions. Uh, I would certainly say that you know the euro dollar is going to uh, have some impact. Pound dollar, again, but it's been out in its own with the Brexit that you know was meant to you know end the world, but you know clearly hasn't. Uh, but obviously, you know, the other full ramifications of Brexit and, and you know are nowhere near you know coming through to the forefront of what's going to happen. Uh, you know, any any you know the net, over the next kind of you know years to come, and especially when you know the uh, Article 50 is finally triggered. But if you read the uh, the FT. On a daily basis, they keep pointing out that Brexit may not happen. I'm not quite sure, you know, what, where they're coming from with that, but I guess you know anything is possible. So before we start, as always, remember the risk warning. Remember that spread betting and CFD trading both carry a high risk or capital, with possible of losing more than initial investment. These products may be suited for all investors and only intended for people with age of 18. Please ensure you're fully aware of the risks involved and necessary seek independent financial advice. Education only, content of the webinars, personal opinion of the moderator, not trend.com. The content does not constitute financial investment or tax advice. Your advice is discussed through a specific requirement than an independent financial advisor prior to entering any bet. Intro.com is not responsible and disclaims all liability for the content content during this session. So again, apologies if you've heard the intro, but we have done it a number of times, but things don't change. So when we're talking about economic releases, we're talking about leading indicators and lagging. So leading by its name offer a preliminary sign to potential upcoming change to the business cycle. So you consumer expectations, building permits, money supply. Okay, easy. Lagging indicators are things that take a little bit more time to uh, to filter through to the economy. And that is unemployment related figures, consumer producer price index. And again I've gone on for for, for a number of months and years about the CPI and PPI, which you know when interest rates were normalized and you know we had you know normal interest rates or so anywhere above three percent you know two and a half percent three percent you know it's classed as you know fairly normal um you know the, the the consumer producer price index is very important you know very inflationary but we had that steady growth we had the employment so we're just you know focusing on the uh the inflationary side which the consumer consumer producer price index you know gave us a good measure of so i think realistically until we get back in the US, I would say, I think, you know, back to a percent, then we can start to, you know, re-look at the CPI and PPI. I, you know, again, I got it wrong. Um, you know, I was fairly sure that the UK in its position, you know, 18 months back would have looked to have, uh, you know, be the first to uh, hike rates. You know, again, a fairly strong economy, an overheating housing market, you know, Mark Carney telling us that we're not uh, in a consumer-driven recovery. But then keeping interest rates low and then when the Brexit vote didn't go their way, actually cutting interest rates. And there's talk of interest rates going to 0 
in, in the not too near future. And we could say that Mark Carney's cushioned the blow of Brexit, Mark Carney this, Mark Carney that. He hasn't done anything. He's just basically sat there and kept interest rates low and carried on buying bonds. I mean, I could have done that. Anybody could have done that. I mean, it's not exactly groundbreaking stuff. And this idea that he's the only person that saw Brexit coming is just nonsense. You know, he just had a contingency plan. If it did, cut rates. I mean, it's hardly rocket science, this stuff, is it? So, I mean, when we look at Mark Carney's long gone in two or three years' time when interest rates finally have to go up and we have some sort of housing bubble or credit crunk crash, you know, we'll just understand what Mark Carney was, an absolute scapegoat. That's all he is, a scapegoat for what, what is going to eventually happen. Things move in cycles, we've always said. You know, interest rates are low, then they go high, they stay high, then they go low. Everything moves in cycles. So at some point, it, 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 no matter what happens over the next 20 years, there will be some sort of rate hike. And everybody, you know, that's buying mortgages, and you remember, you know, the younger generations are getting mortgages for, you know, 25 years, 30 years plus. You know, there's going to be at least a couple of interest rate hikes. And who knows where would they go in 20 years' time? Who, you know, who really knows? So this idea that we've saved the economy and we've saved the world from, from you know, this Brexit shock is just nonsense. It's just another short-termist view to, I don't really know what it is meant to do. I don't really know. I mean, this whole idea of confidence, I don't really know why it's such a big thing. You know, this whole idea, especially in the UK, when they were talking about, you know, the, the doom and gloom after Brexit, it'll be, it'll be 10 years of the unknown. We've already had 10 years of the unknown. So where's the certainty been in the last 10 years? So I don't really understand the argument for that. So if consumer confidence goes down, well, you know, I don't really understand. So what? We've had the biggest credit crunch and correction, you know, since the early, you know, since you know, the, the big crash in the early 1900s. So what, what's going to make people now, you know, fear the world or fear going out spending? You know, if it's going to have happened, it would happened by now. So the idea that, you know, we, we've cushioned it from, uh, you know, from Armageddon by having this uh, low interest rate isn't really working for me. If you're talking about you know, the safety of London and the financial district, then that's really all about, you know, the finance. And banks aren't going to have an influx of money when interest rates keep getting slashed. And if we go to negative deposit rates, unthinkable, it's going to be even worse. You can't charge people to put money in the banks. English people will not allow that. So, again, we're going back to data. That, again, is very UK-centric, and that's all, you know, all, all to do with the UK and the future of the UK. Non-farm payrolls, as we know, is a coincidental indicator. It's the biggest, most complex piece of data that comes out of the US, and that's why it's so volatile, because it doesn't matter how often you trade it or how much you know about trading or economics. It's very difficult to get this number spot on. There's a lot of different moving parts to it. You know, you have the private payrolls, the, the, the uh, participation rate, you have the... Um, um, mine's gone blank there. We have the hourly earnings, etc., etc. There's lots of different parts of uh, the non-farm payroll that make it up, and that's what makes it very difficult to predict. So when we're looking at the data today, we're not just looking at the number of people that are employed, looking at all the things that make it up, but then we're also, as I keep saying, looking at that little bit of forward um, inkling of what's going to happen to interest rates. And as we've seen, interest rate announcements have been much more volatile, I guess, than the, the non-farm payrolls in, in recent months. And that's because the, the, you know, they're the absolutely far-reaching and really affect every facet of the economy. So when you talk about the currency markets, you know, $4 trillion traded every day, think about how much is floating around them in a monthly basis, yearly basis. You know, everyone's struggling to find out where to put the money because when you put your money in the bank, you all know if you have a lot of money in the bank, as I do, you get no interest. So it's boring. So what are you going to do? You know, you look for other investments. That's why the stock markets keep getting bought up every time they dip because you get your four, five, six percent annual return and your dividends. So it seems pretty smart. But people forget that when stock markets finally correct, go into a bear market, you can lose a lot of money. And people have lost tons of money over the years in these crashes but people seem to have forgot that now maybe we've got a different type of investor maybe we've got more savvy investor maybe we've just got more muppets with more money i don't know i don't really care you know all this idea that you know stock markets will carry on forever i mean there's that um little article i read in bloomberg this morning about um who's 40 and worth 3.4 trillion dollars well the stock markets are so it's, it's a triumph of indexing so Again, you know, it's one of these things. People who should be investing for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, but people are very short term is this, this, you know, these days. So if we see like a 10% correction in the stocks in, in six months, then people will start to panic. People aren't playing the long game. So when the correction finally comes, I know we've been talking about it for ages, but when it does come, it's going to be fast. It's going to be brutal. So 
I guess that will come when interest rates are normalized and people get a better option to put in the cash in, in risky stocks. And really, is today's figure going to make that happen? No, it isn't really. And as I say, I don't really see people kind of having this view to put money back into cash until until we get above a percent. And when I talk about you know people, I talk about you know the majority of people that have money that's worth putting in banks and you know the, the one percenters. So today's figure really, I think it's all about positivity. You know, a positive figure. I don't think a negative figure will send the markets down and I don't think the negative figure will have the same effect it has in the past because a negative figure in the past has said that you know the, the Fed have got room to maneuver and you know room to kind of hold off on interest rate hikes I don't think they have that option anymore they've mentioned it too many times and we're just running out of physical time so I think a bad non farm payroll won't push the markets up on, on, a, on a bid where people think that you know we're going to hold off on a rate hike, so I think uh, no matter what happens today, I think actually markets, I think markets are going to kind of you know maybe move sideways, have a little blip up, but then going to go down because I think a bad non-farm payroll means that we're, we're running out of time and it's inevitable it's going to happen at least one hike anyway. I think a good non-farm payroll means that it is more likely to be a September rate hike than uh, you know waiting till later in the year and a bumper figure you know if we get anything above two thirty two forty thousand you know if, if we did have a similar figure to last time then i think that people are going to go you know well maybe the gravy train's over and start actually unwinding or thinking to start unwinding longer term positions while the markets are going to pick up towards you know a september october november and then wind down for christmas i think people will be thinking there might be actually a 2016 17 crossover peak and it might just be now is a good time to start unwinding from these record highs and that's just again just one way of looking at it because i think once the fed if they do raise early that's because they do want to stick another one in cheekily like they did last year before christmas then all of a sudden rates are at three quarters of a percent and you know we're looking close to that one percent and they might have the same view that i do that uh, you know once interest rates are above a percent then you know people are going to start getting interested in cash again and you know things can happen but this is why i say guys it's so complex and trying to think long term is very difficult you know what is long term these days so the no fund payrolls we, we've been through this a million times it's very important okay so it's the bureau of labor statistics it's the same time first friday of the month and it's always at this time, so you have no excuse for missing it. So it's not the, um, it's for all working age people in all professions apart from government employees, household employees, not for profit, and farm employees, how we get its name, the non-farm uh, payroll. So at any one time, it's 80% of the American work workforce. So we all understand what that means. More people working, more people buying. Houses, white goods, you know, etc., etc., etc. Less people claiming social insurance, you know, we, we get it. More people employed is better. So other in things that we're going to look at over the months is going to be the interest rate. I mean, GDP, it's been interesting, you know, it's been steady. We've had a few kind of blips, but realistically, it's still remaining fairly steady. And I think that's another, you know, key marker for uh, Janet Yellen and the Fed that, um, you know, we keep producing, we keep spending. And it, it's it, it's difficult, isn't it, with the economy as huge as America. But, you know, when you're talking about, you know, these huge economies you know point one here point one there does make a big difference but when you aggregate it out and you look over the year you know the trend is there's still more people out there spending money than not so i don't think there's any major shocks i don't think coming from that kind of spending perspective as people get older in america you know they're gonna start leaving the money to kids kids are just have not gonna have had access to this money will spend it and i'm talking about the masses not the kind of you know top 10 percent richest families in america i'm talking about you know your average you know teacher who bought a house for hundred thousand dollars so sells it for half a million dollars kids get the money they go out spending it this is what's going to drive the next boom you know it's going to be in, you know inherited money and money that uh, has just had two generations of, of booms that just can't be repeated in future so that's where the kind of next boom is going to come so you know keep your eye on the gdps but realistically i think um what we're, what we're trying to the, the kind of short-term stuff doesn't matter so much as i say the short-term stuff is all really pointing to interest rates still so again it's the longer term view what kind of figures we're, we need to look at from that i mean it's it's not really kind of figure it's, it's more policy driven um so the figures are just kind of leading us to to the answers but the actual questions will become from the policies you know where are we going to be and, and how we're going to set that out and when you're especially in america we, we could be looking at a clinton administration or a trump 
administration and, and how do you possibly prefer, prepare for that? I mean, how do you? I have absolutely no idea. So it's almost impossible to know what data to look at when you've got two absolute wild cards like Clinton and Trump that, you know, could be in charge of the biggest economy on the planet. I mean, that's why I say, you know, it's become very difficult to trade right now because I'm not too concerned or not they've been too interested in the politics and more interested in the numbers, the, the you know, the, the economic side. But you know, these days you have to be, you know, having, a, you know, a good grounding in the politics because that's what's really driving the economies forward. And it's that fear of the unknown and the fear of the unknown who, who it's going to be. You know, that's, that's the real danger. So, interesting times. So, for the figure, a tight range. It's a little bit of a spike in gold, but I'll go through the uh, the charts in a minute. You know, many a times we see the markets move in the opposite direction before we uh, before we get the figure because people are, you know, or institutions, banks, traders, hedge funds, algorithms, whatever, uh, you know, are kind of, you know, pushing the market in one way so they can get better fills. So, I'd say generally in the quieter times, don't trade before the figure. But then look at the market action, see if there's a bias being formed, and be ready for an outcome. You know, you can buy or sell, it doesn't matter. You know, you can buy or sell anything. You know, it's not about, you know, being right. It's about being right at the right time and, you know, getting some money. You know, if the market goes down and you want to buy it for 20 pips on a bounce, great. It doesn't matter how you make the money in the markets. It's just knowing that NFP provides that volatility and that provides the opportunity to, tr to trade. So three main ways of trading the markets around any kind of data. Again, I've been through this a million times. So you've got um, trading before the figure, and it's essentially, you know, having a guess, having a punt, having a strong opinion. Whatever, whatever you want to do. If you want to do this, then do it. You want to go long, you know, the S&P into the NFP, why not? You know, it's entirely up to you. I don't mind. All I'll say is I've made as much money as I've lost doing this. And what happens if you're wrong? How do you manage your stops? And how do you realistically prepare for a big figure that creates the kind of volatility it does and you know it's so hard to predict so really for me it doesn't offer much of an edge holding stick at both ends again it's just placing orbital limit orders in and outside the range so again trying to get these it's almost like the elastic band style you know of trading you know that, that kind of theory the market will spike up you want to get filled right at the top it snaps back to fair value bang you get out so you can you know, try and stack the order book as sensibly as you want. Try and get some fills on the high or the low. There is no guaranteed way of making money. So a lot of people over the years have said, well, why don't I just put orders above and below? I'll get filled in each one and make money. Yeah, well, of course. If it was that easier, then that would that'd be done, wouldn't it? You know, if, if you can think of it, hmm, so could somebody else. So, no, that doesn't work. Simple. Then we've got the uh, trading the aftermath. And that's really, again, what we've done over the years. It's waiting for that... Um, that the release, you know, see the spike in the market, generally wait for the first five minute candle to close. You know, our old friend Fibonacci or look at the Bollinger Bands or, you know, again, some sort of indication of where markets are oversold, overbought. See, we're going to have a continuation or reversal and, and get involved. And it's really as simple as that. I mean, trying to overcomplicate trading figures it, it, it's very difficult. What you're going to see, though, again, like last time I traded, I had a, a short gold position. And I kind of, you know, held it, averaged in, and I got out for a little loss. You know, it wasn't anything major, but I did lose on that trade. And then I had to kind of get away, and then the comments came out from the Fed. Bang, gold dropped 150 ticks. And it's just one of them, isn't it? It's just kind of the markets are designed to make you think you're wrong. They're designed to push you to your, your limits. They're designed to hold you in, in an offside position as long as it can. And the market will go up, it will go down, it'll do exactly what you think. But when you're involved in the time and the market's moving quickly and aggressively, and you've got any kind of size on, it's designed to make you doubt yourself. So non pump peril hasn't become any easier or any more difficult to trade. It's just different. And I think the whole point I've tried to make over these sessions is it's not necessarily about the figure being good or bad. It's about the ramifications on interest rates. So today, I don't think we'll be any different. So I'm going to share my screens, guys, and we'll go over some, uh, some live markets. As I say, you know, it's always a good idea keeping your eye on gold because gold is, is seems to be heavily traded over the figures these days. So we've seen that little bit of a spike up in the markets before. Uh, you know, we were kind of tantalizingly close to breaking the 1300 level, but we've seen a bounce from that. You know, we've seen these these big spikes in uh, in cable, big spikes in the euro dollar. I still think the euro dollar is, you know, is going to start heading down and, and getting, you know, closer and closer to that parity. And the idea for that is that, no matter what happens with Brexit, you know, it, it is going to happen. And the contagion that, that will bring, I think, really is, is what's going to push the euro over the edge. I don't think anybody thinks long term that the euro 
has got much chance of surviving with um, the migrant crisis, with the you know the, the youth unemployment, the unemployment rates, and just any kind of growth figures. Just for me, are just are just nonsense. The nonsense and you know, as Mario Draghi, very much like Mark Carney, Mario Draghi is just interested in keeping the bank, uh, the European Central Bank's credibility intact as a world player. He's not really interested in the welfare of people, and people will just have enough. And that's, again, why Brexit happened. People were sick and tired of London getting all the limelight and all the kind of money. So the London didn't want Brexit, so the rest of the country decided, well, if you don't want it, well, we want it. And <laughs> for no other reason. And that's why the majority of people were Googling, you know, the EU after the vote. But that's democracy, guys. You know, just because you have people voting for things they don't understand doesn't mean they don't have a vote. Unfortunately, is the way it goes. So I would say, you know, again, we've seen this a little bit of a correction across the board um, in, in the stocks. You know, we've broken this really kind of nice trend level in the DAX on the hourlies. But as I say, you go to the monthly charts, every time we see any kind of dip or any kind of rejection to the low side, we buy up. You know, the same on the weekly. So we could easily move down this trend channel after all these weeks of buying in the DAX, you know, get down to more reasonable levels at 10,371, maybe the bottom of the channel, round about, you know, 10,100. But it looks like we're moving into this trend channel here, which could be quite nice, but it's still an up channel. And again, every time we reject on the low side, we buy back up. So I guess while there's no alternative to stocks, as in, you know, there's no reason to put your money in a bank or put your money in a, in a property right now with whatever uh, quote uncertainty there is stocks seem to be relatively strong no matter where they are in the range so the DAX isn't much different I would say to uh, the S&P you know I guess S&P has gone on to make record highs but you know we are in a downward trend on the hourlies on the short term four hourlies but then you only have to go back to the monthlies and you see again the same pattern rejection higher rejection higher rejection higher so could we go on to make new highs today with a, with a bumper NFP? Probably not, because again, the bumper non-farm payroll means rates are more likely to go up quicker. Uh, a bad non-farm payroll probably doesn't mean that rates are going to go up. So again, it's, it's one of these things, it's probably all, everything's pointing to stock selling off. But don't be fooled, because what can happen is we get you know an inline non-farm payroll and we, we spike up to you know 2180 uh, in the uh, in the S and P, and then we drop off for the rest of the day. I mean, again, it's this is the problem. You see, the market won't just give you that, you know, no brainer, no, you know, no stress trade, will it? You know, just because we we think that everything points to, you know, the NFP uh, having a negative effect on stocks doesn't mean they're going to just naturally sell off, does it? But we'll have to see. And again, you know, we've got gold spiking up again. Which could be an indication of, you know, again, we'd be looking traditionally for a for a low non-farm payroll today. But this is the problem. You see, you generally see the markets before the figure, if they're going to be manipulated, manipulated in the opposite way. So look, look at gold now. Look at it go. So this is the real problem, isn't it? And then you'll see the figure probably trading back to, you know, thirteen thirty. But who's going to start shorting gold now at seven minutes for the figure? But again, this is something to keep your eye on. Look at the market movements, and again, look for the possibility of any outcome. So no fan payroll today is expected at 175. It was previously 255. The low of the range 125. The high of the range 215. The private payrolls was expected today at 179. Was previously 217. A low and a quite a low one here of 100,000. A high quite a tight one of 195. The um, hourly earnings was 0 0.2. Uh, it was expected today it was previously 0 0.3, 0 0.0 on the low side, 0 0.3 on the high side. And the unemployment rate was previously 4.9, expected today at 4.8, 4.8 on the low and 4.9 on the high. So I guess previous figure 255, uh, a bumper figure there, you know, higher than expected outside the range. So maybe if there's any revisions to that figure, we should keep one eye out on that. Um, also... The unemployment rate has been known to, you know, ha have an effect. So if you have a, an inline figure, keep your eye on the unemployment rate and the hourly earnings as a bigger range on the low side to the high side. So that again could be um, a slight factor. As I say, a lot of data going to come through, a lot of things to kind of consider, a lot of things to kind of really keep your eye on. But again, it's going back to that major um, understanding that a good non-farm payroll could lead to um, a September. A view that September is going to be the time for the first hike. A bad figure could delay that until October, uh, and a bad figure, if even though it's a bad figure, there's a minus or a zero figure, then that really could, 
you know, put a bid back into the stocks because then it could be, you know, a massive drop in data means that the Fed have all of a sudden got things wrong and are going to have to really, you know, consider about interest rates. So that might even, you know, be the best outcome. A terrible non-farm payroll could be a license for stocks to sell off really, really quickly and buy as much as you can for that big, you know, uh, big bounce. And that's really what we've seen, you know, over the last kind of couple of years is big, big sales in the stocks have bounced. And it'll be that one time that, you know, you see that big sell in the stocks and you lump in and that's the correction. It comes and it drops, you know, a thousand points in a day, in an hour. You know, anything can happen these days. And all this idea that flash crashes can't happen because we've got security measures in place and blah, blah, nonsense, nonsense, nonsense. You know, it's markets move up, they move down. It's just how they work. So, uh that's it you know nothing's really changed in trading so a little bit of you know negativity now in the FTSE uh, DAX same kind of thing but it's had a little bit of a bounce a lot of green candles in the SMI so we're obviously going to see some red at some point um, euro dollar again you know some good fib levels here working in play but I'm still I'm always as I've said be selling high in the uh, in the euro dollar dollar yen has had a bit of a you know resurgence we've got this gap still in play here so if we did want to smash and hold below 100 this gap would be the target i just can't see us getting that low because japan's in a whole world of trouble and you know the dollar is still the world's currency and when we're talking about interest rates going up that's the only major economy talking about that so there has to be demand for the dollar and i think we're pretty low and i think really now's the time for for big dollar buying so weeklies same scenario and we've been selling off heavily that's quite a steep curve um, I would say that realistically now we've found support these good areas that key psychological level of the hundred I would say not so long before we start hitting back to 17 and 111 would be it'd be it'd be fine I would say in the next kind of few months to uh, assume we be getting back to those regions So really three minutes for the figure now, guys. So it's time to, you know, have a have a think about the size you want to trade, you know, have an idea of the uh, the products you want to get involved in. As I say, keep your eye on gold, this screen here, because it generally moves before the figure and, you know, the, you can see big volatile moves. Euro dollar, again, I would say definitely if we see a strong uh, non-farm payroll uh, for me, I, I'm going to see that euro dollar get hit and probably retrace, um, you know, these previous, you know, spiked gains. Pound. Depending really, you know, the pounds really bounced on UK data, so I'd expect less of a retracement into this um, into this this big spike in the pound. Cause that's for its own reasons. So I expect set more self in the in the dollar, sorry, in the euro against the dollar, than the pound against the dollar. And again, a strong figure could could get us, you know, back to 104 in the um, in the dollar yen. So again, gold giving away them gains on that that random spike. S and P unchanged. Uh, DAX even going positive nearly after um, after the the, the SMI and FTSE have, have gone a little bit negative pre figure. So again, one minute now to the data, data guys. So the headline figure of 175. 175. I'm going to say buy, 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 sell, sell, sell based upon just the basics of of, of the S and P and a good figure, bad figure mentality. But remember, good figure is not necessarily good. So I think what we'll do is just uh, wait for the figure, run through it as quick as we can, see what the data is all about, and then just watch the movement and then try and get involved uh, after the first five-minute print. All right, guys, so 175 is the call today. Get ready. See gold spiking again. 1336. Euro spiking. Get ready, guys. Ten seconds. One five one, one five one, one five one. So lower than expected, but not massively. One five one, a little bit lower than expected. What's that euro spike? Go sell some euro. Sell some euro up here. Okay, so 151, waiting for the rest of the data, waiting for the rest of the data. Well, what's that, what's that dollar? What's that dollar hitting these lows here? Okay, so private payrolls. Uh, 151 for the uh, non farm payrolls. Uh, 0 0.1 for the average hourly earnings. 4.9 for the unemployment rate. So, again,
So the 292 print from June has been revised lower as well. So uh, lots going on here. Lots going on here. So, I mean, my, my, don't know about you guys. My system's freezing up. Um, I've just got out that Euro trade uh, for, for a pathetic fill. Never mind. So, again, majority of kind of, you know, got the trade balance coming as well that kind of threw us last time. That's better than expected, you know, 39.4 uh, against the minus 42. But slightly worse than expected on farm payroll. But, and again, nothing major here. So, we've seen, you know, the dollar really kind of hit these lows here, back down to 102.950. We've seen the euro spike up. We've seen gold again. Spiking really on that on that lower figure, and again a big big spike. So I'd expect a big retracement on that. The DAX and absolutely nothing. The S and P's gone slightly positive now. As I said, in line or bad figure. You know, it, it's a tough one. This is too. It's not bad enough to kind of you know, in any way you think the Fed will do anything based upon this data. So it's just kind of solid enough to to think that the course that the Fed have set. I'm talking about a rate hike before the end of the year is going to is going to be on the cards. But S and P is going positive now. Okay, so you expect gold to come back. I mean, it's a spike on nothing. Uh, dollars, you know, had some good bounces off them low fib levels that we've got in play here. The uh, 261 spot eight. Again, you know, a um, little push up higher in, in the euro, but I'm always happy to, you know, sell the, the euro higher. That's a good daily level up there. So a mixed kind of bag, really. A mixed bag. It's always difficult when you get uh, we get a figure like that. Because as I say, you know, it's an, an inline figure gives the, give them, give, you know, gives the big players a license to do whatever they want, put as much volume as they can through the markets because it's not going to make any it's going to make any difference is it you know markets will go up and down and probably finish where they started based upon the data the only thing that's massively you know out, out of line i guess is that trade balance and that you know again is um you know it, when you talk about you know the billions you know that is you know a good uh you know uh three billion uh, or so less than uh, that was forecast which is which is good, good news. But the headline figure, you know, is 151, which isn't really particularly out of line when you're talking a complex figure like the non-farm payrolls. You know, we're pretty much um, a little bit down on the weekly earnings and um, the hourly earnings have gone down to the lower end of the estimate of 0 0.1. But, you know, nothing really that's going to start affecting policy. So for me, you know, again, it looks like, I, I don't know, that's difficult. I mean, obviously the dollar's taking a tumble because... You know, a slightly weaker figure, you know, means that the Fed might might hold off and it might not be September. But then I'll be buying as many dollars as I can because it's still inevitable. It's still inevitable that the rate hike is going to come. So you're going to be buying them dollars over the end. So, again, as I say, most markets moving the opposite way before they go. So, uh, again, the S&P is taking a good bid here. DAX, a really good level up here at 106.03 spot 9. That big trend line I said. So maybe a, a little tiny um, short scalp on, on the sell side. Um, you know, again, it's difficult because stocks are going up. Uh, gold's going up, euro's going up, pound's going up, the dollar's coming back up now. So this is why it's difficult to trade, you know, just after that non-farm peril. And the, the volatility before that was absolutely insane. I mean, you saw the way the market's moving, you know, a couple of seconds before the release. So really, really kind of tricky stuff. Okay, everyone's pretty quiet today, guys. Has anybody got any thoughts, any questions? Anybody, anybody traded? Has anybody got a view on that? Has anybody been, been involved in the markets? Anyone long, short? Again, you know, that, that spike in gold, it got as high as 1336 spot nine. That could have been a, a little selling point. But I still think, you know, with that kind of, you know, that kind of data, you know, it's it's almost like it's not bad news. But in, in line news for me is always as expected. So it always errs on the side of good news. So good news for me means rate hike, which means coming imminently, which means buy the lows in the dollar, sell the highs in the euro. But then the other side is, if I know that, everyone knows that. So watch for the squeeze. So wait, wait for uh, you know the first five-minute count to print. Maybe we see a, a cheeky higher high made in the euro, lower low made in the dollar. But then that's when we're getting, you know, that bounce back. That's when we're getting the value. So again, you know, let let's see the five-minute charts in gold. Five-minute charts in the euro. Let's look at the dollar yen. So as I say, you know, big bigger move in the in the um, in the euro dollar than we saw in the pound. But, you know, the pound's still, you know, gaining some traction. So, I think, we don't, I mean, we can put, put the Fibonacci on. I mean, it's, it's, it's going to be fairly clear to see. But, let's see. I would say that the euro for me. There we go. So, there we go. Yeah, that was interesting. As, as I was just, I was talking, there was that bit of a, a delay. We've seen a gap down in, 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 the, in the dollar here. So, as, as we say, High highs are, are now made. Uh, sorry, put 15 minutes instead of five. So we've seen um, 
yeah, see new highs made in, in the euro there, but only slightly, only slightly, and new lows like that kind of was gapped down in the dollar. So, again, that kind of inline data is just giving people an option to push the market as far as they can in, in I guess, you know, in our quotes, the wrong direction. So obviously that any kind of weakness in the dollar now is going to you know push that uh, that euro and the pound up slightly. But what I would, what I, what, I would, what I would be thinking is you know for me as I said that this uh, a license to kind of you know for the, the big guys to print money that you know the situation hasn't really changed. So people that are buying you know that um, the dollar on on that kind of inline data are getting smashed out here, and then the big boys pushing it down as far as they can, getting the fills down here, and then I would be not surprised by 2.30 in the cash open if we're not trading back above 103.420 even not back to 103 because that to me inline data signals that rate hikes again have to be have to be on the cards so again that euro is now after the high high just by a pip coming back down to the 50 percent in the euro dollar has to be the target i would say at one uh, spot 12086 Right, so comments coming through. September's the one and done for the year. That's comments coming through. So, I mean, take that however you want. That if a rate hike is coming, buy the dollar, sell the euro. I mean, it's you know, if it's coming, it's coming. But then, you know, this data isn't weak enough to say one and done. And that's why I don't understand. That's why I hate the comments that come through. These 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 no mark people coming through saying things over over the wires. It could be one and done. How can you say it's one and done based upon that data though? It's inline data, pretty much. It's not bad. It's not great. We've had a great non-farm payroll, slight revision. We have this, this, this inline data. So one and done. I cannot see that, to be honest. So gold, you know, it's traded the exact same way as the euro dollar. Seeing that spike made the higher high, literally by a pip, and then coming back down. So if we don't make any inroads to kind of bounce off the 23 or 38.2 i would certainly say gold deserves back to be uh to be back at 13 17 spot two and one one two oh eight six you know the same for the euro dollar um you know big big wide bollinger bands you know on that spike down on the uh, on the dollar but as i said you sell the euro you buy the dollar low it's it, it's it just seems to be the way that's been working o over time again it's it's you know it, it's history repeating itself and that's what we know we know what happened in the past and we're using that to predict the future he's just saying hesitated and it was a little bit too late i mean it's it, no no don't need to feel bad there at all Ian. i mean that was uh you know a lot of jumpy spiky horrible movement so that wasn't nice at all so uh yeah i mean hesitation i think is probably a good thing i would say uh definitely it's um it was a little bit too jumpy for my liking prefigure Martin saying New Zealand dollar sell limit order 0 0.7340 got filled slightly higher figure so pleased at that expecting dollar strength later today early next week yeah I have to agree with all what you said there Martin yeah definitely that was right spot on with my thinking so again DAX trying to make its way up you know to that that trend line so again could be interesting we had a, a you know a big break of the trend line before so we could see a similar bounce back down or the market could massively overextend. I can't see how the dollar would remain weak on 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 that figure. I can't see how the dollar would remain weak on on that comment. I can't. I just cannot see how the dollar's going to remain weak. So as I say, you know, it's kind of taking that pain threshold if you're buying the dollar, and then taking that extra bit of pain that the market loves to inject. That it knows if you're right, and it knows you have a one percent of your account as a stop, so it'll push you an extra twenty, thirty pips to make you get out. I mean, you might, the thing is, what you should do is like we should always say, buy the dollar. Sell the euro, okay. Put that in now. Come back in an hour and a half when the um, US has opened, you know, and, and, and allowed to trade. Seen that data, taken on stock, and then you know, take the money. But the markets make it so difficult with that jumpy movement. I guess you know again, if you're US trade and you come in, you think, oh, worse than expected, non farm payroll, buy some gold, sell some stocks. I mean, that could be like the most basic argument of you know the most rookie trade you've ever seen but i think for all the arguments that i've made in the entire presentation about interest rates about short medium term long term look that no matter you know bad data you know it, you know it is it's not really when it's this close to the you know the um expectation it's not really bad data but it because it's almost in line it gives the market license to blip up blip down do what it wants because it can't really affect you know the the longer term view uh, nobody's going to come out and nobody should come out and say anything definitive based upon this figure just now 
I mean, it's not great. It's not disastrous. It's not amazing, but it's not terrible. It, it's it's completely subjective. So I'd say that realistically, you know, that's what the markets are showing. They don't want to go up. They don't necessarily want to go particularly down. They're just out there, you know, being volatile and people are making money from it. So I would say I would be amazed if we don't get back to the 50% in the euro. I'd be amazed if we don't get back to the 50% in gold. Uh, and then the correlations between stock and gold and currency is quite difficult right now. I think this is trading off, off of what it's trading off it, its own, you know, it, the people that are involved in their markets. I don't expect to see the stocks to suddenly dump off and, and gold spike up from this point. I think it'll just be normal technical trading based upon the players that were involved or brave enough to be involved prior to the figure. I don't think anybody can take any, um, any long-term view from, from this. So I guess it's status quo. It's what we know. Janet Yellen said that rates are going to go up. She's hinted at September. This isn't a dreadful figure. We're in September. The last piece of, you know, well, it's the first piece of data because it's the 2nd of September. So the first piece of meaningful data and you look across, it's a little bit red, but it ain't so bad. So for me, that's status quo. The interest rates coming in September. And if anyone can hand on heart and say that's one and done, then you're a better man and you know much more about the economy and the world than I do. So I'd say that, you know, again, that euro has to come off and that dollar's got to come up because that's the only conclusion I can make from it. All right, guys, any, any other thoughts, any other questions? Again, generally, we have this lull now. We have this kind of people taking these positions into the uh, into the US Open. So there might not necessarily be a great deal of money to be made right now. But, I mean, there will be some money made definitely in, in the open uh, of the US markets, the cash open, because um, people will be taking you know views now into that uh, rate decision and that possibility, that stronger than likely possibility that it will be in September. If it's if it any less... Than the lower range, which is 125, I'd be concerned. But 151, and uh, you know, the, the headline I had was 175 from uh, from Bloomberg. I mean, that's that's as close as close to being fine as you're going to get. So uh, I wouldn't be too concerned at all about any of the figures today. It's it hasn't changed anything in in my view, and I don't think it'll change anything from from Janet Yellen's view. So I think now really is about waiting, I guess, waiting for. Um, but yeah, that that open of uh, the cash open of the, of America and see see where the momentum drives it. I'm not saying we won't see a new high in the euro or gold or anything, but what I'm saying is I think it will return back to that that 50%. I think that just seems the most logical thing. We've seen a spike on nothing, and I don't think it's a a spike that people will be willing to hold on to. Why would you hold on to the euro long from this point? I, I just don't see that being any value. So I think the spike is just as we've always seen to kind of get the big boys filled higher up, and when the uh, you know, the, the Americans digest it on the open. They're going to go, yeah, well, it's still a green light go for, for rates. So let's get rid of that euro, get buying some dollars, and uh, and away we go. Yeah, I think, Martin, yeah, you're definitely right. I mean, it's status quo for stocks. Stocks have to correct at some point, And as interest rates creep up, people will put money in the bank because that's what happens. But I don't think we're going to see a big correction in the stocks until we're closer to that 1% mark, as I said earlier on. And as I said, these things are inevitable. You know, we talk about things long enough, which I have. <laughs> they will happen. I've talked about gold getting back to $1,000. It was close. But, you know, again, I, you know, I'm selling it all from the highs. Just because you're not right doesn't mean you don't make money. I still think the euro is going to hit parity. I still think the contagion, uh, the Brexit, you know, again, when we kick in Article 50 next year, I still think that's going to do nothing good for the euro. Uh, I think the dollar can't help but remain strong because the rest of the world's freaking out about everything. You know, you've got everyone scrabbling around, you know, monetary policy, and the only the Americans, crazily enough, that are talking any kind of sense by putting rates up. And as we speak, look at that dollar. As I said, we get back above 103, 405 by 230. We might get there even sooner. So uh, as dollar remains strong, you're going to see that. Well, if the dollar remains going back strong and re retraces that 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 downward spike, then you're going to see a massive, I think, blip up. Then you're going to see gold get smashed back down to that 50%. Euro smashed back down to uh, well below that 50%. The pound, not so much, as I said, because the pound's trading off its own data, and I think people are more interested in buying. A little bit longer term in the pound because obviously the Brexit nonsense hasn't materialised. So I would say stay, you know, a little bit bearish on the euro. Uh, remain uh, slightly optimistic the pound. The dollar, I think, you know, as as a as a real opportunity here to massively overextend on the upside. And gold, uh, the, the stocks I'd leave alone for now because I think the stocks are going to find it difficult to get 
any real direction based upon that figure. So definitely currencies and gold uh, for the US Open is where I'd be uh, positioning myself and looking for the next opportunity. Okay, Andrew's saying that the intraday platform not working as norm, freezing up, unable to trade. Yeah, it was a little bit of um, a little bit of a, a slight hesitation, but I mean, everybody is the same on, on I guess, an MT4 when the uh, before the figure. There's, there's so much liquidity going through, and then people pulling, shifting orders. You just have to be prepared for that. It doesn't really matter what platform you trade on. And I'm, I'm being honest here. I'm not being, you know, biased or intertrader. You know, it's when you trade like that, and you have the big boys in play. It's what you've got to expect. You're paying for a free platform. Well, you're not paying for a platform. If you want direct market access that doesn't freeze, then you know, you're going to be paying you two and a half, three thousand 3,000 quid to uh, the places I used to manage. And even then, when I was trading you know, TTI, I'd see a freeze. I'd see the exchange go down momentarily. There's no guarantees. I mean, at the end of the day, you've got to know your limits. And when you're trading a spread betting platform, you know you can't compete with the big boys. And that's why I tell you, and I've told you for years and years and years and years, we don't trade the figure. We wait. And I did. I traded a little tiny clip. It took me... 30 seconds to get filled, and uh, I got out for a, a, a tiny profit, but then I'm only trading minuscule size, so I was willing to take that risk. If you want to trade big size, then you've got to wait for that first five-minute candle to print, unfortunately, because that's just how it works. You know, you're not, you're not paying for direct market access. You're not paying for anything. It doesn't matter if you're with IG, you know, Alpari, with, you know, CMC. You know, it doesn't matter who you're with. You know, everybody experiences the same. It's, it's the markets. It's not the platform. It's the markets. It's the sheer volume going through. So... We're all in the same boat here. We're all trading off Intraders platform, so a freeze is a freeze. And I think the big thing to do also as well is not to kind of beat yourself up or start blaming the system or start blaming Intertrader because at the end of the day, you know, I've got clients that have made uh, one to three thousand pounds every single day, every single day for the last twenty nine days on Intertrader. Yep, I've made my money in Intertrader. I've made you know lots of money in Intertrader over the years. So I made lots of money in other platforms. It doesn't really matter. You can't let things like that, you know involve you or, or take your folks away from trading you know it's you know these are the rules of the game you know you will get a slowdown when you're getting you know huge amounts of orders put through and pulled at the same time just you know 10 seconds after a figure so we've got to be realistic and that's why we wait for the five minute candle to print because uh, you know that's when the liquidity returns to normal okay david's asking when's your best guess for expected big downward correction in stock indices in 2007 or longer term i mean it, it's it's how long's piece of string there but it's almost impossible to say but what i would say is as we get close to that one percent as we get close to people realizing that stocks are risky people will pull out of stocks and into cash when you talk about the big boys pulling out you know because remember this is the thing that you know it depends how you look at the world some of my clients worth billions absolutely you know, billions some of the richest people on the planet how i've got to know them God only knows. Must be my sparkling personality. But anyway, these guys aren't looking for a massive amount of return on their money. You're looking for half a percent when you've got that kind of money. So when interest rates finally get sensible, they will pull out of stocks and they will go into safe havens of cash because that's what they want, the money to be protected. They don't want to make big returns. So when the big boys see it's attractive enough to get back into banks, which they probably partly own, they will put big amounts of money back in the cash and they will take it out of the stocks and they will take it out of the bonds. And that's what's going to see the big correction. So to answer your question, David, I would say yes, mid to mid, depending on how the Brexit thing goes, kind of mid to late 2017, or when interest rates get to a percent or three quarters of a percent, that's when we're going to see the big correction. And, and I think the Fed knows it, and I know it, and all the big investment houses certainly know it, that stocks are on borrowed time, but for the time being, I'll tell you what, it's still buy them dips, because... Uh, you know, the UK are not going to put rates up anytime soon. Neither is the European Union. So, uh, you know, I think the Fed are taking a calculating risk here to get some money in, you know, next year and get things pumped up. So they're willing to sacrifice, you know, the highs in stocks for that stability. And that's what they should be doing. You know, it's not, um, it's not down to the stock market to make everybody rich. Stock market's, you know, long-term investment. But what goes up will come down. And I think that, uh, you know, the, the problems you've seen with Apple, the big tax bill, the problem now you've got with Samsung and problem you've got with all the kind of mobile you know kind of makers is you know the coming to saturation you know they're kind of they're, they're almost too big a target so you know there will be some pop in that or maybe it's a pop in facebook maybe it's tesla there's a pop in electricity something something will trigger it but it will be correlated with higher interest rates than we're seeing now and people just you know saying enough's enough you know that they don't believe the hype but maybe it's trump maybe if trump gets in that's a license for the stock markets to crash i don't know what the trigger will be 
but it will happen and it will happen sometime in the next 18 months to two years i would say but when it's really going to happen if i knew that then you know i'll be a better man wouldn't i look at look at i said dollars the one to look for the over over correction here we've got back to the um you know the levels i said so if we break up here make these new highs then i'd say the dollar can easily get back to 13690 so as that pushes up we broke through the 50 percent in the euro so the 61.8 a full retracement is on the cards you'd expect gold to start getting a little bit negative now if, uh, if if that dollar continues just to kind of pump up stocks remaining fairly unchanged really in europe you know fairly positive in the us but nothing to write home about so the euro was the sell wasn't it we made we you know made a high buy a pip and it was always going to get back to that 50 percent you know we we're always going to see that dollar strength Um, I mean, it's on hold, I guess, the UK, but I mean, it's the Brexit that's kind of taking over. I mean, figures are figures, you know, they'll come, they'll go, but it's the uncertainty of Brexit, you know, the, all the media hype about trade deals, all the media hype about this, that and the other. So I think Mark Carney will hold off. I mean, the wheels haven't fallen off the UK, but I think, you know, it's more likely we're going to see a hold before we see a cut. Uh, I don't think we'll see another cut uh, straight after a cut. So um, I think we'll kind of hold the ship steady until... We're very, very close to um, to the, the, triggering the Article 50, which is not going to be until next year, so I've been told. So I'd say that unless the wheels fall off, we won't see another cut in the UK. Um, and that's why I've always said, you know, be a buyer of the pound because it's it's going to have value. You know, it's just going to have value and remain to have value because I still think it's much, much stronger um, in real terms than the euro, the yen, the Aussie dollar, New Zealand dollar. So it's going to find a lot of value down the low points. But... Again, they're going into politics, aren't we, really? Economics is, is just one side. It's how well Theresa May and the team and Cameron, etc., deal with the Brexit negotiations and if people actually see it you know, being good or bad. We might look at back at this in 12 months' time and think, wow, Brexit, why didn't we do it earlier? It's been the best thing we've done. We've got all these great trade deals. We're back on our own and everything's hunky-dory. But again, like I said, I mean, that's crystal ball stuff, isn't it? Alright guys, well like I said, I mean, let's wait to uh, see what happens in the US Open in 40 minutes. Um, again, stocks still looking strong, but you know, they could turn, you know, they could turn, you know, aggressively negative if the US think that, you know, that's one hike and it's not one and done and more hikes are coming. So we could see a bit of a sell-off onto that Friday afternoon. Um, dollar, yeah, a little bit of retracement from that, that new high, but I still think it's got plenty of room to the upside. And uh, as I say, you know, keep your eyes on the currency, keep your eyes to that US Open and um, be ready for an outcome. All right, guys. Well, thanks for your participation. As always, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, more things coming towards um, the end of uh, of next week, but then after that, there's going to be a, a little little bit of a break for a while because I'm getting married at the weekend. Then I'm off on honeymoon. So for the first time in six years, I'll be taking a couple of weeks off. So uh, I'll be back. Don't worry. We'll have lots of more data and lots of more interesting webinar topics. Hopefully, when I write some more material to go through. And uh, until then, guys. Listen, um, have, a, have a great trading session. I'll speak to you all very soon. Okay, take it easy. Thanks, guys.